where the consequence is that we seek protection in a group similar to ourselves while labeling others as, as, as the enemy. And my sense is that even in the, in the social compacts that you were describing with Ned Lack um, and others, the business and, 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 and government and labor in South Africa have been stuck in some variation of those three difficult conversations since CODESA. And we have things heighten at different points, but where there's no real resolution to those kinds of conversations that has taken place in the last um, 27 years, really, since 1990. But also, um, there doesn't seem to be any recognition of the need to settle those conversations in order to be able to move forward. The second thing about the social compact that interests me is that social compacts come with sacrifice. And I think that's something that we we don't talk about often enough in South Africa is that a social compact is, yes, it's the, the very nature of a win-win situation is that you're not winning everything, right? So you sacrifice something and there seems to be a deep reluctance um, on the part, and I agree with what, with what Simon was saying, especially on the part of business and on the part of white business, to, to sacrifice and to, to sacrifice the rules of the game that are going to grow your wealth um, rapidly in the short or medium term in order to have long-term gain. There seems to be a reluctance to, um, to, to sacrifice being right. <laughs> even amongst the different actors. So I just want to hear your views on the nuances of that kind of social compact, that building a social compact is difficult and it's not just an institutional thing, it's, it's about trust. And, and so I just want to hear your views about those difficult com conversations. And Simon, you walked into this, and I know you're not one of the authors, but I have to ask you, you've mentioned the taxes that were paid in, um, in, in, in Germany and, um, and in other places, and you know, this conversation of a wealth tax has gone um, on and on. And you know, one of the recommendations from Bishop Dutu actually after the TRC was that there be a, a once-off tax um, in uh, of reparations, and and that was um, not adopted by the government of the time. Um, do you think that it would be a good thing for us to have some kind of wealth tax at this stage in South Africa um, in order to drive some of these um, transformational projects? Um, and how do you think it would need to take place? Thanks very much. Very challenging questions, very useful comments. But I like difficult conversations, so let me try and have a few now. Um, we certainly need difficult conversations. I think the first thing that perhaps needs to change is about <coughs> who's having the conversations. Um, I think our political discourse in South Africa very much focuses on transformation as too often meaning uh, redistribution amongst ownership of big business. In my mind, the problems are not the Oppenheimers, the problems are people like me, where the imbalances actually come in in a real way. Um, I mean, if you look, if we wanted to redistribute wealth for the very richest, the big business people, it's relatively easy. I mean, there's lots of economic implications, but you know, there's 2,600 people in South Africa who have a net wealth of more than 75 million rand. 2,600. They'd probably fit in this venue. We could round them all up, get them all here, and have a conversation and shift some wealth around. That doesn't actually create meaningful change for the vast majority in the country. Um, and yet our obsession with ownership and how we have these discussions really, I think, just derails us from what actually created the types of imbalances that we see every day in the shops and on the sides of the roads and basically in who has access to jobs and wealth and all these important things. Um, what we need to start having a conversation about is exactly as you identified, these types of fundamental intergenerational progress things that really allow people like me to have advantages. Things like my grandfather being able to get access to a good job on the, the rails um, when black people couldn't have access to those types of jobs. Because those are the types of things that creates long-term change and creates long-term change on a mass basis rather than just for the elites. So I think we really need to move away from this discourse of trying to have justice for billionaires first. We need justice for the vast majority first. Um, the second thing I'll say, Simon, uh, you mentioned Undermining business confidence. I think talk of, like real talk of radical economic transformation will undermine business confidence. I think that's because business is not a rational political actor. Um, they might be somewhat more rational in economics, although we can debate that for a long time, but I think basically the way business thinks about a lot of these issues is through an ideological lens, as all of us do. And I think as soon as you start mentioning a lot of these things, business will get scared. However, 
I think at the end of the day, the types of changes that you could make to have a more prosperous society and have people who are, to basically fix a lot of these fundamental problems that business has, would outweigh the initial backlash from business. In the long term, it is good for business to have a more just and equitable society and a more prosperous society, even if in the short term the mechanisms by which we have to get there will create some resistance from business. So our social compact does need to care about what everyone says. It particularly needs to care about what business says because they have so much power to create economic opportunities, but it can't take businesses' views as biblical. Um, we do need to constantly be challenging the way they think about this transformation uh, and the way we deal with them. Uh, maybe let me say, so I don't hog the mic, one more thing on how social welfare could be transformed. So my ultimate dream thing that's not going to happen vision would be that we reserve 30% of government revenue for unconditional cash transfers to everyone, to basically the poorest. So starting from the poorest person and moving up. 30% um, of government revenues right now would be enough just about to give you a thousand rand a month unconditional cash transfer to everyone earning less than 9,600 rand. Um, so that's a big vision that's probably never going to happen. But the core principles that underpin that are that our current system of social welfare basically dilutes itself consistently in how it's distributed. So it goes to certain people within the families, whether they be mothers or older people, um, and their income is immediately diluted amongst families having to support a whole lot of people all at once and do a whole lot of things all at once. Having a more um, open system where it's not just people who are most at need, but it's also people like young people, people from when they're very young, from when they're born, may, perhaps, in my system, um, or from when they're in university and most need support, or from when they're just starting and they need to, they're raising a family and they're needing to educate their children, whatever it might be. Having a more broad-based system doesn't just benefit those families, it creates a more supportive family environment through the system of redistribution that happens when you drop that social welfare into one individual's hand. So that would be my immediate thing that we need to start doing is basically just expanding who receives money. Um, it is very difficult to do that. We don't have the fiscal space now, so there would have to be cutbacks in other areas. But I do think there is space to do that when you think about how inefficient the structure of our government is, for example. Um, and perhaps we need to start thinking about redistributing some of the support to big industrial indus interests uh, towards more social spending, although again, that's a controversial and debatable topic. But that I think would be the first stage, is really to think about expanding who receives social welfare and thinking beyond narrow needs-based criteria. Uh, perhaps just to start off with uh, the difficult conversations, um, I think there are multiple, I, mean, I fully agree with uh, Chris, I don't think we would disagree, we, we call that uh, the, the chapter. Uh, I think you know the, the, the multiple uh, areas in which the, the conversation should be had, uh, including uh, our do we have a shared understanding of the past as South Africans? Because I I don't think so. Uh, I I don't think we uh, we we understand uh, the the gravity uh, of of the past on on the present. And how the present still reflects the past, you know, from the spatial organization of where we live uh, to uh, patterns of economic participation uh, to asset ownership and uh, uh, access to those assets to to multiply benefits for generationally. Um, I think what the apartheid system did cleverly was to to create a device that reproduces itself generationally, a uh, sort of a monstrosity that would exist beyond uh, the political institutions, even if the political institutions have been dismantled, uh, but the idea of apartheid would, um, would express itself in the social structure and, and, and in the economy. And, and I certainly think that there is a deep sense of resentment um, that, is, uh, you know, that is growing, especially amongst black community. Um, not only amongst the poor, but also amongst uh, the those that come from the black middle class, the the youth, uh, because they, you know, there is this illusion of 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 equality, which is not quite real, uh, which is not substantively, uh, you know, this society is not substan substantively equal, and uh, and they are beginning to qu they have the language to question uh, these inequities in society, and and you find uh, this wave or, or, or this tendency um, in fees must fall, roads must fall, uh, and, uh, and in 
ideological debates about what needs to happen in society. Uh, I mean, if you go to the EFF, uh, these are not, uh, you know, uh, ragtag people who have been rounded up from, from the margins of society or, or you know, the entirely uh, disillusioned from the point of view of uh, social exclusion, but people who, uh, who are highly educated, uh, who, um, who, who think a lot about the structures of society and, and what needs to, to happen to change it. Um, and of course, I mean, there are some who are, without a doubt, uh, instrumentalizing uh, these social inequities for for politi narrow political reasons. I, I I think that we 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 still have a conversation we we need to have about the past, about the present, where we are, and and what what is the source of our angst, and and in those conversations we we should not spare uh, governments in aptitude because I think. Um, uh, along the fact that the, there has been little progress uh, in, you know, in, in overcoming the social legacy of, of, of apartheid. Uh, some of the reasons for that and some of the reasons for, um, for, for high levels of inequality, for policies that are, are not creating jobs, uh, for, you know, for policies that have gotten us into the recession that we are in, uh, are not about the past. They're not the creation of the ghost of apartheid, but the creation of the institutional decay within, within government. And I certainly think that we should talk about corruption. Um, we should talk about institutional decay uh, because the, there is massive corruption that, that's happening that would deprive uh, you know, the future generation of, of the resources that would enable them to, uh, you know, to, build, lively, to, to build livelihood or to have uh, their socio-economic lives uh, are transformed for, for, for the better. The second uh, issue that I wanted to, to talk about very, very briefly uh, is, is that I think whatever we say about resolving the, the challenges of the past and creating foundations for a better future, we do need institutional cred credibility. We, we need... Um, institutional and governance framework uh, that would uh, that would move us forward. Because in the absence of that, whatever you know, uh, uh, great proposals or recommendations we have uh, about innovation, innovation-led uh, and inclusive development, will simply not take root. Because you need institutional capabilities that will drive social and and economic and economic change. And finally, we, I think we have institutions and agencies in society uh, that sit on massive resources. One of, of them is PIC, uh, sit on, I think, about two trillion rands worth of assets. About 90% of this is invested in, in equities, in money markets, and bonds. The other one is, you know, I think, another 5% is in unlisted um, companies. Uh, I think the other 5% is in global equities. And, and I'm just thinking, and you find a lot of investments uh, by the PIC, at least domestically, that go to shopping malls, to, you know, to the, re the retail spaces, to ride the wave of the consumer-oriented, services-oriented uh, growth trajectory. And I'm just thinking that Surely there should be different imagination, different ways of thinking about harnessing the resources of the state towards um, socio-economic development to transform uh, you know, uh, the way things have been. Um, and also, I mean, if you look at uh, IDC, I think they commit every year about 12 billion rands um, of, of, of investments. Uh, many of, I mean, the, the exposure, I think the total exposure is about 50 billion rands upwards in, uh, in blue, blue chip companies, SAPI, BHP, Billetin, uh, and, and, and Sasol and others. And, and I think we have not taken time to think deep, deeply about how we use uh, these uh, entities to achieve the developmental goals uh, that we're talking about. And perhaps we've not clarified, uh, there's no coherent narrative about development and, and how um, we, we achieve we achieve this because if you go to whether you go to Lutuli House or 
union buildings and you talk to people there and ask them about, you know, what do you mean about inclusive development, you'll get thousand answers, thousands of answers. So I think uh, there is a lack of uh, a narrative. But I think what we're talking about is, is about the endowments that people have. Um, and, and wealth taxes, I've had some conversations around this, is, uh, you know, they're very leaky because you have to find mechanisms to, to, to do that. But there are ways in which people have wealth which we can tax, very straightforward ways uh, uh, and ways which are not being dealt with because I think of the kind of elite pact that we have at the moment. Um, and just to bring it really kind of down to earth, I think, if we think about how wealth values have changed, um, one of the very important ones is property. Um, and we have had redistribution of wealth around changing property values. Um, one of them is called the Gau train. Everybody within one kilometer of a Howe train station, their property values have gone up a lot, a, a, a huge amount. Um, and so, I mean, we, and there's no, yet there's no kind of taxation or looking at taxation around, around wealth uh, of, in terms of property. So you could have rates, you could change rates. I mean, the city of Johannesburg could, could do this. They could change the rates and they could make a commitment to invest that uh, in changing transport systems, et cetera, which would change the property values of people whose properties have not gone up very much because we haven't you know, had very big improvements in Metro Rail for, for uh, obvious reasons. Um, so, I mean, you have to look, I think, at what are the kind of material conditions and uh, the ability to invest and upgrade and improve property uh, and what that property is worth is a, is a very, very um, big one. The other, of course, is, is inheritance. And I think people will, if you had higher inheritance taxes, of course people would avoid, duck, et cetera. But inheritance tax is essentially dealing with something which is, seems to, on its face to be so inherently unfair uh, in that uh, that inheritance continues to skew the distribution going forwards, particularly as we have more and more charges that are, in, uh, that are required for building up other endowments, such as education. So the fees must fall is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, a picture of this. But I mean, that starts much lower. Starts, you know, preschool, primary school, secondary school. Uh, and the ability to be able to uh, I I invest uh, in education. I mean, we should we think, I think, a little bit out of the box here. I mean, one of the, it's a not my proposal, it's from somebody called Tony Atkinson, who's been was, he just died recently, but he was working around Piketty. And he said, well, what you really need to do, and he was thinking about this in the context of the UK, which is, is, is what he worked on. And he's saying, look, people in the UK now, young people can't, uh, can't acquire a property, and they can't afford to pay off their uh, student loans uh, for much, much, much longer. So they have huge, really, really big um, challenge uh, about how people, how and where people can afford to, to, to live. This is what you really need is to give people an endowment, everybody endowment at the age of 18, 19, 21, a large sum of money which would essentially cover all of your university education or tertiary education, but you don't need to, to do that tertiary education. So in our context, we're talking about 200,000 rands or so, I suppose. Three years of university education, fees plus a stipend to live, and you say everybody at the age of 18 gets 200,000 rands. 